Hello everyone, uh, my name is Richard Schneeman. On the internet, I go by at Schneems. In the States, we have a hard time pronouncing that, so I like to say it's like Schnauzer or, uh, or Schnapps. Um, I was in the Munich airport and everybody, for some reason, uh, thought I spoke German. My last name is Schneeman, which if you know any German, means uh, snowman, Schneemann. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I love Ruby absolutely positively. Um, I'm going to be marrying her actually on April 27th. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, there's that. Uh, I have a dog named Hans Peter von Wolf. It's it's kind of a long name because he's kind of a long dog. Um, he's actually the fifth, so we instead we just call him Cinco. Uh, you might recognize me from such gems as Sextant. If you don't like running Rails routes in your project, uh, you can use the Sextant gem and they will show up in your browser. This is also a feature introduced in Rails 4, um, which is kind of awesome. I'm pretty happy that that got picked up. I also write, uh, have written the Wicked gem, which is a way to generating step-by-step -step, uh, controller wizards. And most recently, I have a project called Code Triage, where you can, you can um, go and get involved in open source projects. For instance, if you want to get more involved with, say, Rails, you can triage, set, sign up to Triage Rails, and you will get a new open issue every single day. Um, it's a good way to uh, learn more about the, the project and also get involved. It's pretty low impact. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Texas. I did it pretty much so I could actually say, good news, everyone. <laughs> they actually give you a card when you become a professor that gives you the ability to do that. Uh, and I've got all of my course material online. If you know anybody learning Rails, um, I've got 40, 40 hours of quizzes, lectures, uh, videos. All the videos are broken up into five minute chunks and they're all about something very specific so it's not as intimidating, um, as, intimidating as that quite sounds. <clears throat> So I work for Heroku, and, uh, which is pretty awesome, uh, but it does mean I'm not allowed to wear this t-shirt that has gone around uh, the internet. Uh, recently, I was at Australia RubyConf um, about seven days ago, something like that, no, eight, eight days ago, and then I was at Waza in San Francisco like two days ago, and now I'm here. So if I kind of like spontaneously fall asleep in the middle of my talk, uh, <clears throat> please don't judge me. Also, I've traveled very, very long way, um, so I ask, please close your laptops unless you're triaging Rails issues, in, in which case you can definitely keep your laptops open. Okay, so um, I've got 27 minutes and I wanna talk to you about web secure, security and what exactly it means to be secure. Uh, so this is kind of a, a hot button topic recently. There's been a bunch of uh, vulnerabilities. We're actually gonna be going into exactly how some of those work. Um, I just want to let you all know that I'm not a security researcher in any stretch of the imagination, um, and I don't think you have to be either. We shouldn't just put all of this off to the security researchers and be like, oh, you know, seems hard, seems difficult. I don't want to deal with it. Uh, really, this presentation is going to be about giving you knowledge to um, understand common security exploits and security vulnerabilities. and really just get kind of more of, of a feel for what exactly it means to write security, secure software. Okay, so security bugs are bugs. That like seems pretty reasonable, you agree, disagree? Okay, all right, got some head shakes. Um, so some of the most secure software, or some of, the, some of the, the best written software in the world is written for the space program. Um, so we've, uh, I got this from like Wikipedia or something, could be, could be right. Uh, 42,000 lines of code, um, 11 different versions, and it still had 17 errors. Like, it is impossible to write, you know, 100% perfectly bug-free code. Uh, you can get like 99.99999, whatever, you know, it's just like uptime. Um, but, you know, basically bug-free, free software is impossible. So by extension, um, if security bugs are actually just bugs in your software, um, it's, at least to me, it's kind of safe to say that almost every device that you have, um, you, you know, your mobile phone, whatever, has some sort of a, a vulnerability on it. It's just not necessarily uh, publicly exploitable or, or commonly exploitable. Okay. So I want to talk about just some, some really common ones that we're, you, you can see and talk about some mitigation strategies and talk about different ways that we can improve our security processes. You ready? Yes. Are you ready? Come on. Yes. Okay, there we go. 
Okay, the first one I want to talk about is availability. This kind of gets overlooked a lot whenever we're, whenever we're talking about the security space, but security isn't just about keeping other people like out of your system. You always see like Angelina Jolie and like rollerblades like getting into your computer. Uh, sometimes it's about just making sure that your system can actually stay up. Um, and being available to your customers. Uh, so you might have heard of DDoS, stands for Distributed Denial of Service Attack. Um, looks something kind of like, you know, if we have a server, it's normally designed to handle a load that, uh, of cup, a couple of connections across the US, or not the US, the world, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Americans get the, <laughs> we get the two confused pretty, pretty frequently. <laughs> uh, especially when it comes to baseball. Anyway. Um, and you know, so if lots of connections from all over the place start hitting your server, then it's not going to be capable of handling that, and then you, you, it's it's no longer going to be available. Um, so if you ever heard of Anonymous's uh, low low orbit ion cannon, I think that's the yeah that, that's exactly what this is doing, and and that is a sec a form of a security attack. Um, of course, the, the, the most common way to avoid that one is to just block IP addresses. Um, but we can, we can actually in, increase the level of effectiveness of some of those attacks by sending malform requests that our servers might choke on. And, and these are kind of common things that you might want to um, want to consider, especially as your organization grows in size. Generally, if you just have a couple hundred, a couple thousand, a um, couple hundred of thousand of users, maybe you might not be that big of a target, but um, definitely as you grow, people will just attack you for the fun of it, for the, for the lulls, as it, as it were. Um, okay, so the next one I want to just briefly touch on is memory exploits. In Ruby, symbols are not fancy strings. They're actually kind of optimized uh, because symbols are never actually garbage collected. In your program, if you take a user input, and you call to sim on it, you're actually going to be creating a symbol ins inside a memory that is, it's never going to get garbage collected. So um, if someone knows that you're doing this, here we're taking Param's ID and turning it into a symbol. If they just send a bunch of just random garbage and, and random junk, then it, oh, I got a little, little, little sensitive on the clicker there. Um, it'll actually just fill up your your um, your memory, and it'll bring your server down. Yet again, another way that that you can uh, stay uh, try to uh, try to not be vulnerable. Oh, the the hardest part about this is actually dealing with um, with libraries and extensions. A lot of people just don't even kind of kind of think of this one. Okay, next one: parser exploits. Has anybody heard of um, exploit of a billion laughs? Okay. Yes, Steve. Yeah. Steve's heard of everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so this is what the attack looks like. You can actually get this off of Wikipedia. I know I did. <clears throat> and essentially what's happening is we have 10 different XML entries that we've defined. And each of those reference previous entries. So even though that's only like three kilobytes of code, when the XML parser actually tries to parse it, it's going to ex try to s expand each of those entities, and it takes up about three gigs of RAM. And you know, if you're trying to uh, DDoS a system, sending this multiple times versus just sending a normal request is going to absolutely destroy a server. Um, so basically, it's like a zip bomb for XML parsers. Luckily enough, um, yes, ouch. Luckily enough, modern XML parsers are not really vulnerable, um, or not as vulnerable. This is kind of a, a well-known thing. So in, in some ways, it's nice to know that these, these types of things do exist, but it's also nice to know um, that they're generally mitigated. Um, and it's also another reason to kind of rely on historical solutions, like using libxml2. It's kind of a... a uh, or you know, known XML parsers instead of just waking up one morning and saying like, man, I'm going to write my an XML parser, and then you know, run a multi-billion-dollar business off of that. Okay, so authentication. Uh, I, I just really wanted to. I don't know. I I was going through pictures and I had this one in there of mats and I wanted an excuse. Um, I can go on all day uh, talking about authentication, but I actually found out that I had 15 minutes less time than I thought I did. So instead, I'm going to talk about armadillos. Um, <clears throat> this is a little guy that showed up in the, uh, the back of where I live. I, I'm actually from Texas, um, and Texans often get uh, all of the United States or all of the world confused with Texas in addition to just 
Americans getting the world confused. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I don't have time to cover uh, SQL injection attacks, and I thought I skipped that. Terribly sorry. Okay. Um, so, you might have heard of something along the lines of a YAML parser. Maybe? Something? Recently? Okay. Um, does anybody, do you guys know just how this works? Kind of? A little bit? Okay. Well, if you already know, then you're in for a treat because I'm going to tell you again. Okay, so YAML stands for YAML Ain't Markup Language. It looks it looks pretty similar to uh, you know to this. We've seen database.yaml, pretty familiar. It's very human readable, uh, very very writable. We can instantiate it. Uh, we can kind of load files and we can pull things out. Uh, so it, it looks just like a hash. In addition to being able to serialize basic objects, we can serialize arbitrary objects. So um, in, this, in this scenario, we are actually uh, calling and saying that, hey, we're going to build an array um, from a Ruby type array. And whenever we load this, we're actually going to get two different elements inside of our array. OK, so you know, that's not you know, that interesting. But where it gets really interesting is if we say, OK, we want to serialize a user inside of our, um, inside of our YAML. So whenever we do this, if we have a user class defined, a user, a user model defined, it will actually produce a Ruby object, whenever we call yaml.load on it. Uh, and just kind of wanted to dig into a little bit of, the, of what's actually going on here. Inside of the YAML, we're specifying here that this is going to be the, the, the class name we're going to be using. Um, and then each of those attributes that are defined in it, it's going to be passed to it just like a hash. Up there, we've got uh, Ruby slash hash. And uh, as, it's, as it's instantiated, it'll pass each of the attributes as keys and then the values as values, as if it were hash. And then whenever you're done, you've got a fully formed user object. So it's actually, it's actually kind of cool. This is part of the YAML spec. Um, a lot of people have been like, confused in terms of like, they're like, oh man, Ruby's implementing YAML wrong. It's like, no, YAML is actually insanely powerful um, and probably like too powerful. Uh, you know, I guess with great power comes great responsibility or something. Um, okay, so this is only part of the problem. Like this in and of itself, eh, not really that bad uh, of a scenario. Um, it's not inherently insecure. But uh, <clears throat> if we are doing something along the lines of actually calling code whenever, uh, whenever we are instantiating that, that hash, where if we have def um, brackets equals, and then we're taking in a key, and then we're taking in a value, then we can, <clears throat> if we are trying to uh, instantiate this via YAML, that code, whoops, that code actually gets executed whenever we um, instantiate the object. So here, uh, this code is being instantiated just by, just by calling yaml.load. Uh, so again, still not necessarily that, that bad, but uh, let's go a little bit deeper. If we have eval in our code, um, which in this scenario we're not really doing anything, but we could be like defining a method or be doing, you know, that cool like metaprogramming stuff that us Rubyists like love to do, or um, you know, hate to love or love to hate or one of those. <clears throat> if we have this inside of our class, then we can craft our YAML so that the this whole line is an attribute. So this is just pure Ruby code, and then that's our that's our value. So whenever we load it, the attribute is going to be put into the hash key, and then our value is going to um, just be, a, be assigned to that. And at this point in time, because we're evaluating that code, it's going to just run whatever you put in that hash key. Uh, which, so now this is a problem. Now we have 100% um, arbitrary code execution. So you can just put Ruby into, a, into YAML format and if, if there is a vulnerable class, you can just ar execute arbitrary code. So that, that's kind of the underlying problem of using YAML as a serialization format if you don't have tight control over the classes inside of your project. Um, but we're still actually, at this point in time, we're still not 
insecure in, in terms of rails. Um, <clears throat> That, that was all that was needed for the Ruby Gems vulnerability, which also had a, a YAML problem, because they were directly loading YAML. So you could just give it, you could just give it YAML, and it's like, oh, I'm going to load this, which, as it turns out, it's not such a great idea. Um, with Rails, the actual issue came from the XML parser. Uh, one of the features of the XML parser is actually to embed YAML directly inside of XML, <clears throat> which, like. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, if you noticed, I've had two vulnerabilities so far about XML. Maybe you shouldn't use XML. Um, OK, so here we can just de define any kind of XML we want. We kick it up to a, a Ruby server or to a, to a Rails server, and it will go ahead and try to parse this and decode this. Um, so by default, it'll parse your YAML. And then at that point in time, anybody who is hitting your hitting your server uh, can do whatever they want to it. They can install a rootkit. They can get access to all of your files. They can copy like your passwords, your database credentials, like everything. Um, so if, if you haven't updated <laughs> Rails, um, or like, please do that. Like, if you're not using the latest version of 3 or uh, 2.3, um, it's, 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 kind of it's kind of a big deal. So that's kind of just the basis of how that attack works. And just so you know that, that the Rails attack, the Rails vulnerability, and the Ruby Gems vulnerability were kind of the same vector, but they were slightly different attacks. OK, so whenever all of this happened, everybody said, like, whoa, whoa, whoa you know, Rails is insecure, and like PHP is insecure, and like, uh, or sorry, and they were like, PHP is more secure, and like, you should use Python for everything. And if everybody used Java for everything, then like, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but there was, I think, the, pretty much. Every week on Hacker News, there is like somebody was exploited via something, or like J2EE found insecure, or Java found insecure, um, and it's not necessarily a function of your of your language or your framework. Um, it's kind of more a function of um, how how people use it and how aware they are of the possible security exploits. It's um, in this scenario, like obviously, um, for the next year or so, people are going to be like, oh my gosh, we, we should be really, really secure whenever we're using YAML. Um, but you should also be aware uh, that serializing and deserializing other type, uh, data types like um, uh, CSV, actually, or, um, or Marshall dump and Marshall load can, can um, actually cause some, cause some problems. So in general, uh, you always want to make sure that you're going to be uh, sanitizing your user inputs. In, in this scenario, it was actually, it, as individual programmers, this happened before it even hit your own Rails code. Um, so there's not really much that you could do about it. But um, maybe if you signed up for code triage.com and were triaging Rails issues, um, a couple of you are. I can see with your laptops open right now. Um, then it, it might not be as big of a deal. Um, also, you, I found out that you can sanitize your floor with this little steamer cleaner. It's incredibly effective, way better than mopping. Best $30 I ever spent on Amazon. Highly recommend it. <laughs> OK. Um, so the, the, in general, like just never, ever trust users or trust user input um, or your dogs. They will tear through everything. I, I'll show you my wallet. He like bit into my driver's license. It's, yeah, it's not, it's not pretty. Um, OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is a uh, ROBA, well, ROB attack. Um, and this stands for Roomba attack. Uh, and this is, of course, whenever you just have spare power cords kind of laying around and your Roomba just eats your lamps as a general result. Um, you want to, you, it's kind of difficult to mitigate, but um, OK, well, moving on. Uh, with, with all of, all of, the, all of the YAML, um, vulnerabilities, one thing did happen very right, um, and that's responsible disclosure. Uh, Rails does have a security report page. It looks kind of something like this. That gives very detailed um, explanations of how to actually report a security breach. Um, and I actually strongly recommend that organizations, or you know, even if, if you're a large enough business to have a security disclosure page um, and actually come up and think about some sort of a policy where if somebody finds an attack vector that instead of just posting it on Hacker News, that they actually contact you. And then they post it on Hacker News. Um, 
so I'll also recommend using some sort of um, uh, logging, uh, like off-site logging. Uh, this won't always guarantee you a, the ability to go back and see if you were exploited, but it, it can help. Um, like one, one example would be using Paper Trail. This is kind of a third-party service that just it takes your logs and it archives them. And then you can kind of search back through. Um, so if a vulnerability is reported and it, and it does take you a little bit of time to actually patch, you might be able to to comb through and see if um, some kind of suspicious behavior was happening. So in, yeah, in general, just um, stay informed, as informed as humanly possible. Subscribe to Rails security lists, or you know, it doesn't have to be Rails, whatever you're using. Um, if you're, if you're uh, managing your own VMs, if you're on a VPS, you need to know what operating system you're using. Um, and subscribe to those mailing lists. Like you need to be prepared to patch those. Make sure that people are still updating and maintaining those operating systems. Um, this, you, like it's kind of one of those things that just kind of gets gets swept under the floor. But uh, if you're not doing that, a a patch to Ruby itself or to its to the operating system um, can be just at, can make you just as vulnerable as a security vulnerability to to Rails. Uh, so yeah, patch early and patch often. Whew. Okay, um, any questions about that? Okay, actually, sorry, no, uh, questions later. I'm gonna talk about secrets really quick. Okay, uh, so CSRF, this stands for Cross-Site Request Forgery. Bef I actually made this site, this slide, before the whole YAML debacle. Like, um, Cross-Site Request Forgery is where um, Rails attempts to validate that a form that you submit is actually from the same server and that somebody isn't trying to access and post data across a different site. So. Um, the way that we do this inside of Rails, uh, and, and this is kind of a very common vulnerability that can lead to many other vulnerabilities, is by setting a config.secure token. If you, there's a config initializer secure um, file. And in general, whenever we're talking about Rails, this is the key to your digital kingdom. So when we're talking about keys, oh. Would you give your car keys to your interns, or maybe your apartment keys to your contractors, or how about your open source contributors? Would you just like be throwing your keys around? Like personally, I wouldn't. And if um, if you've if you have your secure keys inside of your source control, then you already have. As soon as you hired that contractor and you said you or you clicked that button on GitHub and you said add this collaborator, then um, if you have any of these items inside of your Rails app, then, well, you, you have. Um, the best way to protect your code is to not store your secure keys in source control. Uh, an alternative to that is using environment variables. So um, what do I mean by using environment variables? Inside of Rails, we've seen that you can specify and, and run commands by setting uh, using different environment variables. Here we're setting the Rails env equals test. Okay, seems, seems reasonable. Um, this is actually from the RubyGems repository where instead of um, specifying the, uh, the secret token, they are actually pulling that from an environment variable called secret token. So although they're completely and totally open source, they're, they are still secure because you don't know what that token is. You can't just go into the repository and, and forge their credentials. So that's probably a good thing. I'd agree. Dis All right, got some nod, nod in heads. Um, so in, if you want to do this, the next logical question is how do I develop my application if I have these types of um, tokens in my environment for, uh, variables? So we can use a, a .env file. A .env file might look just something like this. Here we have environment variables equal to values. And then if we use uh, something along the lines of a .env gem, conveniently named because we're using .env files, <clears throat> we can actually source that file and use it to load those different, uh, those different tokens. So here it's loaded our environment file and Inside of Ruby, we can actually pull out um, the secret token environment variable. If, uh, if you're already using Foreman with your project, maybe, maybe you're using Heroku, maybe you've got a proc file, maybe you're running things along those lines. Um, then you, 
then you can use form and run and then a command. And that'll actually go ahead and automatically source that .env file and put those values into, um, into your environment where Ruby can go ahead and get a hold of them. If you're in production, uh, and you're using Heroku, we directly support this, and this is something that, that we advocate. Um, we call it config instead of environment variables. I guess it, it sounds more productized. Um, so you can do Heroku config add, and then secret token equals, and then just whatever that secret token is. Um, and this is also, uh, we favor using environment variables um, in general, and this, like, we use the, say, database URL rather than the database.yaml that your, your project actually provides, again, because of the same reason. Um, you, know, you don't want to check in your database.yaml if it's got your a plain text password to your database, um, and, you know, that, and that password has root access. That would be kind of bad. In your VPS, you can do the same thing. If you use uh, Foreman or the .env gem, you can just use those directly in production. Um, I've seen some people telling me that they actually maintain a separate Git repo of just their, their environment variables that is separate from their current Git repo. <clears throat> or they might add those values directly to um, the command or call them via bash rc. The next logical question, though, would be, um, you know, is this still secure? What if someone can read my environment variables like it? Kind of, kind of seems bad. Now, if they can read your environment variables, they can probably also read your files as well. So, you know, either way, um, either way, you're 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 probably in the uh, in the same spot. Uh, so, after you know, with all of that, like the it's it's kind of difficult to say like is your app secure? Is uh, in terms of uh, in terms of secrets, in terms of not leaking passwords and, and leaking protected information, and I don't just mean what I what I mentioned the database URL, the passwords, um, the secret token. I'm also talking about um, S3 credentials, you know, Facebook credentials. If you hire a contractor and the you know for whatever reason you end up like there was a payment dispute or something, and and um, they have your Twitter credentials, like that's probably not good. <laughs> I mean, feel free to argue with me otherwise. Um, but the, the best litmus test for figuring out if you're actually at risk for this is to, to ask yourself, is my app completely open sourceable? It, could I hit that publish button on GitHub right now and change from private to public? And would I, you know, would I be OK or would I be putting myself and my customers at risk? If the answer is no, then maybe you might want to kind of rethink um, what you're doing in regards to your, uh, your secret tokens. So again, um, secret tokens, just one example of configuration or config. And you can uh, use this to define any manner of, of other elements within your system. OK, uh, so yeah. It also gives you the added ab ability of being capable of changing things on the fly. So if you are using environment variables, then you don't have to deploy to continually update your code. So use environment variables. And just because you like storing things in Git, like because you love YAML files, and um, you know, it's like I've been on projects where we, we've had like 30 developers, and we just had these YAML files of like, you know, in development, like if this developer, like this, 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 this credential, and like it just kept on going on and on and on and on, and it's just like these night, like everybody has these files, or it's in Ruby, and it's like if this, then this, um, and it's just a lot more. It's a lot easier to tell it what to use rather than saying if else, if else. So be explicit instead of implicit. Um, also, one of my wish lists for Rails is gonna is to have uh, secure rotatable keys. So right now you can only have one token. Um, if you want to change that token, then basically anybody else who, who was using a different token in the middle of a deploy and who's then submitting, it, you know, submitting a form afterwards will get a failed um, submission. So that's just kind of something I would like. OK, so quick wrap up. We talked about security. Nothing is ever 100% secure. Uh, you need to try to educate yourself to understand, you know, what, whenever you see these security vulnerabilities come out, um, ask questions. Like, go to your coworkers and your user groups and, like, mailing lists. Um, comment on Stack Overflow, or not Stack Overflow, on Hacker News <laughs> may not be the best source of information. Sometimes they are. Uh, but really just understanding the attack vectors and, um, and how to write code that, uh, that can avoid them is probably the, the best way to go. 
Uh, with, with secrets, please just like quit storing secrets inside of Git. Um, you don't necessarily have to use environment variables, but um, you should use environment variables. <clears throat> If you have alternative suggestions, uh, please come and find me, find me after, afterwards, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that. And so the title of, the, uh, of my talk is uh, Security Secrets and Shenanigans. So um, I've, we've, I've got some shenanigans. <laughs> I love this movie. Um, and one last thing, uh, vote for Ruby Hero. It doesn't have to be Terrence Lee. But you should ask yourself not what Bundler can do for you, but what you can do for your Bundler maintainer. <laughs> All right, um, I've got, I guess, a few more minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Don't you think there's that kind of thing where it should just <clears throat> fail loudly that you didn't set an end? Um, maybe. <laughs> um, it it's kind of one of those things where it's like it's more developer friendly by default. Like if you're just pulling it down, um, so it might actually make a little bit more sense to raise say or accept you know raise an exception saying like you know you need to set a .env file and, and put this in there or um, or even have some sort of a generator script that automatically creates your .env file and, and pipes stuff in there uh, personally i like uh, being really explicit in my readme and saying in the readme setup um, like right now code triage it's open source you can go again check it out you can sign up for it codetriage.com sign up today um, and uh, in the source, you'll actually see it requires GitHub credentials, and the README actually covers step by step how you know how to actually import those credentials into the project, and it it has a development workflow. So, um, yes, we. Um, <laughs> that answer your question? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I yeah. Um, I think it should be a little bit more secure by default, uh, and one or even one of the ways you could get around that is say in production, you know, if if environment is production, then raise an error um, at the top of that file. But like there there's there are some ways that we can get our convenience without having to sacrifice security and and vice versa. And we just need to, as a community, um, I think, pay a little bit more attention to that. More questions. Okay, you suggest to use, for example, Lonely for having uh, uh, yeah, all logs in one place and to use it. Yeah, but the problem with Lonely for, for me was that yeah, Lonely is just open port for LSS logs, so I could, uh, sorry, paper trace. Mm -hmm. So I could put everywhere on this port, so uh, in short time I could exceed my limits, and yeah, and then I have leak of money, uh, <laughs> not, not leak of security. Right? <laughs> That's why, for example, I switched to use Lonely instead of use paper trace. So yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in, other than just security, I, I recommend just keeping um, a copy of your logs. Just in, in like if somebody reports an issue and they're like, oh, I couldn't log into my account, and you've got a hundred thousand users, and like you know you're not going to be able to tail the logs as they're causing the exception. Being able to actually go back and find those. Um, or just kind of exception loggers, but um, not knowing if, like having absolutely no way of knowing if somebody actually got into your system is kind of bad. Um, so I, and, but, yeah, and. But this way, like how log is secure, that you're defining which device could connect to this pod. This is enough security for me, right? But Pepe, I don't have this functionality at all, right? That's, that's why we avoid to using it. Okay, so access access to uh, to storing something in your uh, port for logging, log for lo logging, right? Okay, so you're you're saying for you that Logly was more Logly secure. Logly is more secure. For okay, you. all right, cool. Any more questions? Um, what do you think about the concept of? Chef has the concept of data bytes, which can store anything, and they can be encrypted as well, so you can version your credentials and encrypt them. What do you think about that approach? 
I think that sounds great. <laughs> well, where um, a lot of people then store your their chef recipes in in like a version control mm -hmm. as well. Um, would that be in the same? Um, so like you know you have your cookbooks and stuff. You can you have just a separate directory. Called okay. Data bags. Mm -hmm. They are usually JSON, I believe, but they can be encrypted by chef. So when you provision a, a machine, then you just decrypt it with a password. It just generates uh, whatever you need, actually. So oh. you can have credentials for your database in your chef repo, but it's still encrypted. So yeah. Matter cool. of time, right? Hmm? Matter of time. Because it is scripted, so... Well, somebody will crack it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It. Yeah, but in, That's the, why you're in those though. time, you can tend it. Yeah, but or they crack it. But, but that if you know about that, that they crack. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But then you have to continuously iterate through new new versions and new credentials. No, this, no. This is completely you, using environment variables is completely secret. You need to change them if you know that they leak. <laughs> it. But maybe maybe they you don't know it, that. <clears throat> that. Oh, okay. So so if you didn't follow all of that, there was one comment followed up by like ten separate comments, like two se ten other separate comments. Like there's a lot of edge cases and like security problems are like straight up bugs and bugs have edge cases. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Anybody excited for lunch? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> we will have uh, another panel about security after lunch, so at 3 p.m., so there will be more of this stuff. Thanks a lot, Richard.